is God, and can we truly know Him? Over the last 2,000 years, we've tried to envision Him, sometimes even to the point of contorting Him to fit into our box. Because of our limited imagination, we can fail to grasp a limitless God, a God who is three distinct persons, but yet one, not only a Father, but a Son and a Holy Spirit. But can we truly know who God is? Can we relate to Him and trust Him the way a child trusts a father? As deep cries to deep, we all long to connect with our Creator. Knowing who God is doesn't just depend on us. He has already made a way for us to know Him. What if He can be known by His voice and His Spirit and His Word and His creation? God is beyond our imagination, yet He invites us to come to Him, to know Him, and to walk with Him. This is how we truly come to know who God is. Welcome to New Life Online. My name is Dave Finley. I'm the pastor at New Life Assembly in Killarney, Manitoba. And we're so glad that you've joined us for our online program today. Uh, we trust that you will sense God's presence and experience His power and love in your life today, wherever you are. You may know that uh, we have begun services in person again now here at 411 Finley Street in Killarney. And if you're in the area, we certainly would love to have you come and visit with us and uh, check us out. We'd love to have you worship with us together. God willing, today we are going to finish a series of messages entitled, Who is God? In which we've looked at uh, God revealing himself to man in a very personal way. And so we finish that today. But next Sunday, we start a new series of messages talking about simply Jesus. You know, religion and Christianity even has become very complicated over the years. And we believe that we need to go back and just focus our attention on Jesus, on loving him and following him. And so we're going to start a series of messages next Sunday titled Simply Jesus. And we'd love to have you join us either in person or online for those services. If you'd like more information about New Life Assembly, you can always connect with us by texting the word connect to the number 431 400 9585 and we'll be sure to get some information out to you in just a few moments laura is going to lead us in worship and praise why don't you join along with her would you bow with me in prayer father we thank you for this day thank you for this opportunity to worship together we pray your blessing upon each person that has joined us today online and in person and we pray god that your holy spirit will be very real in each one of our lives in jesus name we pray amen
in the city of Victoria at the corner of Dundas Street and Dallas Road, there is a marker that says mile zero. It marks the beginning of the west to east traverse of Canada, the 8,000 kilometer stretch of highways that we know as the Trans-Canada Highway ending in Newfoundland. But the starting point was also meant to be the finishing point. Years ago, when Terry Fox started his Marathon of Hope in Newfoundland, the plan was that he would cross Canada and finish his Marathon of Hope at mile zero in Victoria. Of course, the circumstances changed. Terry got sick and passed away. The Marathon of Hope ended at Thunder Bay, Ontario. Today, we are concluding a series of messages titled, Who is God?, in which we talk about God revealing himself in a very personal way to Moses in the book of Exodus 34. But it's also a starting place because this is where we have to start our understanding of who God is. God reveals himself to Moses and it's a big revelation. He talks about his love and his grace and his faithfulness, but he speaks about more. John 3.16 is the, the most quoted verse in all the Bible, but Exodus 34 verses 6 and 7 are the most quoted verses in the Bible by the Bible. Over 20 times, other Bible writers quote Exodus 34, God's words to Moses. And so it becomes our starting place in our understanding of who God is. There are parts of God that we don't always agree with or understand. We call them the flip side, the other side of God. We speak about a God who's loving and gracious and kind and merciful, and we love that God. But the Bible also speaks about a God who is just. The Bible says that in verse 34, that he will surely not clear the guilty, but he will visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons and their children, even to the third and fourth generations. That doesn't make sense, does it? For us, that just does not make sense. What kind of God would hold people accountable for sins that were made in previous generations? As I said, this is the flip side of God. It's the part of God that we don't fully understand and we don't always like. Years ago, when records first came out, an artist would put out a record on which was a very popular song, a song that they thought would be a hit. And on the flip side of the record, there was another song that was not as well known or as popular. We all want our children to be the prettiest children in the nursery, but sometimes they're not. That's life. And part of understanding God is that it is not always just loving and kind and gracious. There's an aspect of God that we don't always agree with. We sometimes tend to avoid it or maybe excuse it. But the Bible says that God is just and holy. Someone once asked me and said, Pastor, it seems like in the Old Testament, God is seen as hard and vindictive whereas Jesus reveals a kind and loving God. Are there two sides to God? Well, yes, but God reveals himself in both ways, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is only one God and he has not changed. Jesus came to show us what God was like and Exodus 34 is our mile zero our starting place in understanding who God is. Jesus revealed God in a fuller way, but we need to understand what God says in Exodus 34. We read that he does not leave the guilty unpunished. We know that God is very loving and kind and gracious. We know that. 
That's his nature. But it also says that he is a forgiving God. Now, let's be honest. Some people don't want to be forgiven. There are some people who deny the very fact that they are sinners. They don't want to acknowledge their sin. They refuse to acknowledge that there's any law that they've broken. There is no concept of breaking God's law whatsoever. And they refuse to even acknowledge the fact that they are sinners. There is another group of people who acknowledge their sin and they're almost boastful of it. They are proud of what they have done. They fly in the face of God and and quickly acknowledge their wrongdoing. They even uh, question and party. They, they, they suggest that it'll be a great party in hell when they're punished for their wrongdoing. There's no sense of remorse or repentance whatsoever. God is not who we think he is. He is who he says he is. And God does not leave the guilty unpunished. He must punish sin. God is a just God, and we need to understand that. We need to remind ourselves that God's end goal is not to be vindictive, and it's not because he has a vendetta against people who do wrong, but God's end goal is to have a world that's without sin. Don't you want to live in a world where there's no more school shootings? Don't you want to live in a world where you don't have to worry about some unsuspecting elderly person being scammed out of their money? Don't you want to live in a world where there are no more wars or ethnic cleansings? Don't you want to live in a world where uh, people are not abused and beaten and sexually abused? Don't you want to live in a world where there's no more racism or injustice? Of course, that's the kind of world we want to live in. And in order for that world to come, we know that God has to punish sin. God has to deal with sin and God will hold people accountable. That's what the Bible teaches us over and over. In fact, throughout the scriptures, we're told that God is a just God. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 18, pardon me, verse 8, the Bible says, The Lord, I, the Lord, love justice. In Isaiah 30, verse 18, we read, therefore, the, lo the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke about justice as well. He said in Luke chapter 18, verse 7, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? And in Acts chapter 17, we read, because God has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. We love to speak about God and Jesus as our Savior and Lord, but we also remember that Jesus will one day come as our Lord and judge. God is a just God. The scripture says that he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? That does not correspond with a loving caring God, a gracious God. How can that be? Does God hold people accountable for things they haven't done that somebody else has done? We need to get the full uh, scriptures and what all the Bible says. In Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, we read that parents are not to be put to death for their children, nor children put to death for their parents. Each will die for their own sin. God does not hold people accountable for things they haven't done. God holds each person accountable for their own wrongdoing. And we need to grasp that very clearly. This is exactly what Jeremiah spoke about in chapter 32, 
where he says about this verse in Exodus, you show love to thousands, but bring the punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct and as their deeds deserve. The Bible's very clear that you will not be responsible for the sins of your ancestors. But there are some things that are interesting and that we need to learn in regards to families. We need to understand that often a parent's sin and behavior has consequences on the future of their children. Think of a uh, a drug addict who indulges in his addiction. His children don't indulge in it, and yet they often pay the price. They often go without food, without groceries, with the money being spent on drugs. Their parents often end up in jail or in rehab. They suffer the consequences of their parents being an addict. Think of divorce, a very common thing to happen. And we know that when marriages break up, often children are the ones that pay the biggest price. They suffer the most. Children often are affected by the sins of their parents. Another thing we know is that sins sometimes tend to run in the family. I've heard of uh, alcoholics whose children are alcoholics, gamblers who, who have suffered and, and, and their children have suffered and yet their children pick up the same habit. Sin tends to run in the family. Have you ever said, I'll never be like my father. I'll never speak like my mother does. And yet years later, you find yourself doing the same thing or acting in the same way as your parents did. Sin tends to run in the family. We tend to pick up the characteristics and the actions and the behavior of our parents. But I want to remind you today that God's grace and mercy can break the generational curses of sin in your life. I've heard many stories of people who were abusers of their children, whose children then became abusers. But that does not have to be. Jesus Christ died to break the curse. And you do not have to carry on in the sin of your parents or of your grandparents. You can be set free. You can change the course of history. God wants to do a new thing in your life today. God loves you so much. Isn't this a picture of the gospel message, we understand that there is a scale. And on the scale, we see God's justice. God is a just God and he must punish sin. He will punish sin. But on the other side of the scale, there is mercy and there is love and there is grace. And the Bible tells us that God's grace and mercy outweighs. The Bible says in James that God's mercy triumphs over judgment. We need to be mindful of that, regardless of what we've done, regardless of how we have failed. God's mercy in our lives triumphs over judgment, and God wants us to experience his love and grace. This is the story of the gospel, and we need to see the big picture. God is just, and he will punish sin. There's no question about that. That's a, a for certain thing. It may not have happened to this point. The Bible says in Peter that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A time of judgment is coming. God doesn't want to judge people or punish people, but he must punish sin. But the Bible tells us that God is abounding in love and mercy. And it's that abounding love and mercy that makes it possible for you and I to be forgiven. This is the gospel message. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says that Christ saved us not because of the righteous things, the good things that we've done, 
but because of his mercy, he washed us, he washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. That's what God wants to do in your life today. If you've never received Christ as your savior, if you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, you can do that today. Some of you are praying for unsaved friends and loved ones. Let me encourage you to keep doing so. God is a gracious, merciful, uh, loving God. His kindness knows no end. And God is reaching out to your loved ones. We continue to pray for them that they may come to a knowledge of the Savior of Jesus Christ. God bless you.